marketing departments and supply chain departments should be talking. People are just trying different things. You know, we've all really been shoved into this place of consistent change. Everything's going virtually, it's going digitally. Everybody is looking at different ways to really get their story out there and they can't really plan as far ahead as they used to. Hello and welcome to Break Free with Top Rank Marketing. I am Joshua Knight. I'm Senior Content Marketing Manager here at Top Rank Marketing. And I'm here today with Sarah Barnes Humphrey. She is the founder and host of the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast and the CEO of Ships or Ship Z as it's known in America, although not known as Ship Z in Canada, which I think is inconsistent, but we'll let it ride. Sarah, thanks so much for being on camera with us today. Hey, Josh, I absolutely appreciate being here. So thanks so much for having me. So we have a kind of a dual purpose for this season to break free. You know, our our audience is mostly marketers, but they are marketers who are looking for subject matter experts or thought leaders or influencers. At least one of those terms is a dirty word to every single person I've talked Mm, to. But however you want to say it, folks who know stuff that is valuable to our audience. So we want to talk about the, your area of expertise, what you're known for. And then also we want to reflect a little bit on that and the nature of that, you know, influential, thought leader celebrity. You're a celebrity is what we're saying. Oh, I don't know about that, but thanks. <laughs> Look, as much as there are supply chain rock stars, I think we have to say that you are one. Oh, well, thank you. I will take that all day long. <laughs> all right. So as a supply chain rock star, let's start with, um, I think we, we have to start with the pandemic. You know, we have mm. multiple crises. I had to look up the plural for crisis because there are so many things that are going on right now. What is that doing to supply chain? I know we're seeing some of it like in our supermarkets and stuff, of course, but what is happening with supply chain and how are people having to adjust? Wow, that is a loaded question. I mean, and we've kind of done this like big evolution since the beginning of everything happened up until now. And then I think we're going to continue to see more of an evolution in supply chain moving forward, depending on what happens in the fall, right? Because it's still totally up in the air. So as far as supply chain, I mean, supply chain is having some of the same challenges that other industries are having, right? When it comes to remote working, when it comes to going back into the workplace and having a high, potentially a hybrid environment and what that looks like, you know, finding talent, obviously with all of the layoffs and furloughs and and different things like that, that are happening globally, there's a reshuffle in a lot of the companies um, as far as talent. Are they going to be coming back in the office? Are they going to stay remote? Does that mean that we now need to look for local talent? Does that mean that we go globally for talent? So supply chain leaders are really tasked with a lot right now. They're also pulling off technology options off the, sh- off the shelf, putting those into play so that everything is becoming a little bit more efficient and uh, potentially figuring out where that fits into their processes because they're just like any industry, right? They've been putting a few things off for a couple of years and now you know, COVID has really fast forwarded a lot of things that needed to get done in every industry. And that just includes supply chain. I think, you know, from the beginning of the epidemic where we saw some empty shelves to now, you know, supply chains and supply chain professionals being able to adjust to the supply and demand. I think, you know, with a lot of retails going on, le- retailers going online and more people are buying online, there's just so much to unpack there. There's a lot going on in supply chain. <laughs> It's fascinating because this is something that for the average person was invisible six months ago, or I guess nine months ago now, but that yeah. is influences every aspect of our lives. But we don't think about, oh, when I order this from Amazon, it doesn't come from the shelf at Target. So if that demand shifts, then here I am. But you're talking about there's also this staffing part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Is it, what kind of technologies are you seeing people bring into play just to handle some of these? Like RPA. So they're implementing, you know, bots to be able to help with, you know, potentially customer service. There's a lot of tech in documentation. So supply chain is very documentation heavy. You know, there's a lot of documents. We need to go paperless, obviously, with sustainability uh, being in the forefront of everybody's minds as well. And so just a lot of different technologies that are bringing the processes that they currently do, just making them that much more efficient. How do we get off of spreadsheets 
and into a more technological environment because if any, I don't know if any of your audience knows, but traditionally some parts of supply chain like freight forwarding and, and things like that have been, um, you know, traditionally very, very manual. And so just looking at bringing in and adopting some of those technologies and just going back to what you said about how we're hearing more about it. I mean, it's super exciting and I'm going to sound like a supply chain nerd right now, but it is super exciting to hear like politicians talking about supply chain. I think we even had one of our supply chain rock stars on the Dr. Oz show, you know, talking about supply chain, (laughs) which was like that went viral over LinkedIn because everybody was like, I can't even believe, you know, we got a supply chain professional on Dr. Oz. Is it good to have that increased attention or is it, oh gosh, here come people who don't know what they're talking about, who are going to try and you know, write legislation or propose changes? What, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing. We have seen a little bit of that from the U.S. government trying to come down on pricing when it comes to mm-hmm. food supply chain and stuff like that. But that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. But in general, I think it's a, a good thing because if you think about it, you know, supply chain really is the backbone of every company right? It's tied to customer experience now with delivery of goods, you know, like it's the customer is going to make or break you depending on on what that delivery looks like sometimes, Mm -hmm. right? It's tied into marketing. I talk about this all the time, you know, marketing departments and supply chain departments should be talking because if you're going to put out a discount one week, they need to make sure that they've got the inventory or they have at least got it coming and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot of collaboration that can happen uh, with supply chain internally in a lot of different companies. And I think we're seeing more and more of that, which is exciting, especially for supply chain professionals, because they really want to work. They're problem solvers, right? That's, that's who we are as professionals. We are problem solvers. That's what we do on a day-to-day basis. And we want to collaborate with the different departments internally to really create, you know, that, that success for the company that, that we're working for. And do you feel like we're seeing some good progress towards those goals? And do you think that this is going to stick once we get back to what I'm laughingly referring to as normal? Yeah. <laughs> if we, should we ever get there? Like, do you think there's some progress being made and are these lasting changes if so? I would hope so. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't really know what that's going to look like, but I would absolutely hope, hope so. I mean, on my show, People are probably tired of hearing this from me, but I say the collaboration is the future of business. And I truly believe that, right? I think the only way forward is to really be able to understand what your colleagues in marketing or understand what your colleagues in customer service or understand what your colleagues in procurement are going through and what they do on a day-to-day basis that can really enhance what you're doing as an individual in your department to really create the best environment and the most success for the company that you're working for. Is there something that marketing leaders in these big B2B organizations can do to start reaching out to the supply chain folks, like a a fruit basket or a cake or what should we do? (laughs) I don't know. Walking by with some chocolate, maybe. I mean, chocolate's my favorite. I mean, dark Mm -hmm. chocolate. I mean, if anybody's going to send me anything. 72% 72% or above. Just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I think it's just about reaching out and saying, hey, you know, I'd really like to have you in our meeting, our next marketing meeting, so that you have an idea of what we're doing, what we're planning, what we're talking about. Maybe you have some ideas to throw in there as well. And, you know, they might be good, they might be bad, but at least we're starting the conversation. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Like you, supply chain are the people who are fulfilling the promises that marketing is making in a yeah. way. Now it imagine, sales. Yeah, that you have an idea also of what, what people are interested in and what people are buying, which is something that can be of interest to marketing for sure. Yeah, well, and especially how you've seen it go with supply and demand. The more information that you have, the more data you have at your disposal, you're going to be able to be that much better at your job and really, you know, create that much more success. For everybody. That's something I'm going to have to start including when I'm writing blogs about uh, breaking down barriers in an organization. We talk about marketing sales, customer experience, but it seems like supply chain really does need that seat at the table. Yeah. And so we're starting to see that more, actually. If I don't know if you've heard the, the term chief supply chain officer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we're starting to see more of those titles. We're starting to see more of um, a seat at the table from a C-suite you know, boardroom standpoint, where we're having more input on what's happening from a day-to-day standpoint, which 
really is, is like I said previously, the cornerstone of, supply, uh, of a business is supply chain. I believe it. The very backbone of the business, the, the invisible hero that has been yes, keeping the, the toilet paper hero. on the shelves. That yeah. I got to say, if you want to get people's attention, having the toilet paper disappear for two or three weeks was absolutely the way to go about that. I'm not saying there are supply chain supervillains who are planning these things, but if they were, that would be a very good strategy. Well, no, I'm just kidding. We're not those types of people. We are problem solvers. Mm-hmm. We're not problem makers. Well, some of us maybe. Troublemakers and problem solvers, I think, is the good, the go. good way to be, right? <laughs> so having been relentlessly positive up till now, let's talk about what you're seeing happening in response to some of these forces that are changing and exerting pressure that maybe people aren't quite getting right. Are there some mistakes you're seeing that we should be correcting? Oh, I'm sure that there's a lot. Um, Honestly, right now is a time that, you know, people are just trying different things. You know, we've all really been shoved into this place of consistent change um, because of what's happening through the pandemic because of what's happening um, and nobody really knows what that new normal is going to look like and what the fall is really going to bring. And so I'm sure there has been mistakes. Um, you know, not, nothing that really stands out to me as far as a story um, that I could really share with you, um, mm-hmm. but I'm sure that there's a lot. However, I also think that as long as you're agile and can pivot, um, I think I also think that those mistakes are going to be good for innovation. So we talk about, you know, people coming up or your, your team or your internal employees coming up with um, new ideas mm. and, you know, feeling comfortable coming up with new ideas. And I think now is really the time that we should be fostering that because nobody really knows. Nobody really <laughs> has an idea of what it looks like and where we should be and what we should be doing. Um, you know, some people are talking about moving their manufacturing out of China. Well, that's not going to happen overnight. Some people are talking about moving it to the U.S. Well, do we have the infrastructure? I don't know. That's not going to happen overnight. So how do we get there? What does that look like? There's a lot of things that are coming into question right now. And I think we need to foster an environment where we can spark new ideas, which will really spark new innovation uh, for companies. Yeah, I can see, you know, we've had some conversations with folks across different professions and industries, and it it does seem that the being flexible and being able to adapt to change is almost more important than what specific plan you're making. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Like being able to try something and fail is more important than picking the right thing the first time out the gate. And it seems like that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, how are we going to learn and how are we going to move forward if we don't? And by the way, constant change is a beautiful phrase that you just said that I've been searching for a way to describe that for months. Mm-hmm. So the first time I use it, I'll make sure to credit you and we'll link oh. it to you. But that'll show up Thank in you. my work for sure. Keep awesome. an eye out. Constant change because it is this environment of like volatility is the normal, like change is constant. Constant change yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or consistent, way. consistent change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The only true certainty is uncertainty. Yes, then we that start, was a good one. After a while, we get deep into fortune cookie territory, but yeah. the consistency of change is definitely one that, that is happening right now. Uh, so given those ideas, of those, the adaptability and flexibility being the strong suit, how should B2B leaders right now be adapting so that they can have a great 2021 and beyond? Um, that's a really loaded question as well. Um, I think it really goes back to, you know, trying things and making sure that you are agile. I think also, you know, really leaning on your teams that you've already put in place and allowing them to make the decisions. I mean, sometimes we look at some of these enterprise companies and it takes so long to make decisions that in this current environment, you're not going to be able to succeed like that. And so you really need to empower and give that power back to the people that you've put in decision-making roles and allowing them to make the decisions, but also giving them the freedom to to make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, pivot and be agile to be able to to fix the issue. That makes a lot of sense. So prepare for change and expect the unexpected, but also expect the expected because Mm -hmm. both of those things could come to be. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's tough being a, a leader out there, whether you're in marketing, supply chain, what have you, it's tough. They're being pulled in a lot of different directions, right? And nobody really knows where that's going to, where that's going to fall. You know, some people are, some companies are staying remote till the end of the year. You know, some conferences have been canceled up until April next year that I'm hearing about. Hmm. You know, and so how do you, how do you prepare for that? Like you've got a conference that you're supposed to be putting on in March. What do you do? You don't even know whether you can go ahead with that. And what are the parameters around that? I mean, are we going to have to, like if there's a vaccine by then, let's say, are we going to have to provide proof of vaccine before we go to a conference? And is everybody going to be able to get the vaccine prior to that? I don't know. You know, what, what is the insurance that you're going to be able to get around that event? That's going to be based on a lot of factors. From, so from a marketing standpoint, I mean, everything's going virtually. It's going digitally. Everybody is looking at different ways to really get their story out there. And they can't really plan as far ahead as they used to. I think that there's a spot for like a sponsor at a trade show to just sponsor the vaccines for everyone yeah. beforehand. It's, this is, you know, brought to you by SAP or whatever. But then what about the people that don't want it? What about the people that mm. don't want to wear masks? You know, how do you police that? How do you say, well, you can come or you can't come? And what does that mean? What if that's a sponsor? So everybody just gets a like the hazmat suit with a couple of logos on it, like almost like a NASCAR driver combined with mm -hmm. a, like a biohazard suit. Yeah. I could see that. Well, I even asked like on our question of the week, I think it was last week, I asked uh, the community if they would go back to in-person conferences. And the wide variety of responses to that was amazing. Mm. But you have actually given a perfect pivot to the second part of our interview though, now that we're talking about uh, hosting things and, and the more on the marketing side of things. Now, you are someone who is uh, someone that marketers go to when they are looking for expertise to bring to an audience. And we said, you know, some people say subject matter expert or influencer. Uh, influencer tends to bring to mind people holding up things on Instagram, so we right. don't use that as much in the B2B space. But uh, you have a substantial following. You've got this amazing podcast that's going. How, how did all this come to be? What set you on this path? Well, do you want me to go right back to the beginning? I mean, it's not too long of a story. But uh, so my dad owned a private 3PL company, which is a freight forwarding company for anybody in the audience that, that doesn't know the term. And so I spent, you know, 20 years of my career there. I, I did eight years in operations. I did eight years in sales. And then I ended up as director of sales and marketing. And I realized that there wasn't really anywhere for me to tell my brand story in supply chain. I mean, there was the traditional ways, like in the magazines. And I was like, there's not really a cool way for me to really get my brand story out. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts. And I thought, well, hey, if Lewis Howes can do it, I can do it. And I'm going to start a supply chain podcast. And so my team and I got together. I asked a guy from my customs department to come and join me as my co-host. The first episode was an absolute flop, and I think you could probably still find it on YouTube, but it was, we called it Two Babes Talk Supply Chain, and we did that because it was a, a male and a female co-host, and we wanted to see what the market could bear at the time, and we thought it was funny and would get a little bit of attention. And so that's how the podcast started. Um, unfortunately, my dad closed his doors in 2017. And I launched myself into what is now called supply chain media, but at the time was not supply chain media. Mm. Um, I had guests lined up, so I had to pick myself up pretty quickly from that um, and keep going. And I started my Woman in Supply Chain series in January 2018. And then by April 2018, they didn't really resonate with the name anymore. So I then rebranded everything within a week which obviously as marketers in your audience are probably like, you know, fist palming their heads, you know, like, what did she do that for? Because that was the craziest week of my life. But I'm glad that I did. You know, the last two years have been, have been great. And, um, you know, companies come on the show to talk about who they are and what they do. And so I really took the reason why I started the podcast 
and have really um, held on to that and just made that, you know, into what the podcast is today is a platform for supply chain companies to tell their story. What do you think keeps the audience coming back or what attracted them to the podcast in the first place? Um, I get a lot of feedback. People really enjoy the guests. Um, they like to learn about the different companies that are out there. They like to learn about the guests because I'm not having, like I'm having CEO of startups. I'm not having CEOs of the large enterprise companies that they could really listen to anywhere at any conference. I have diverse voices on my Woman in Supply Chain series where I talk to, you know, people on the front lines as well as, you know, directors of or managers of or, you know, truckers, you know, to really come on and tell their story so that we can be inspired by diverse voices. And, I, and I've also been told that people really learn about supply chain by listening to the show because I'm not, if they start you know, uh, with an acronym or something like that, I stop them and I ask them what that means so that the audience can really get a good understanding of what we're talking about and, and what that actually means. So I don't get too technical. You know, I, I, keep, it, I keep, keep it pretty simple and uh, entertaining. It seems like your, your aim is very much humanizing and being accessible and, and turning it into those human stories. Then that makes a yeah. lot of sense. I can see why people would respond to that for sure. That uh, the diversity issue is one that is on my mind a lot as a marketer who we do influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to my chagrin, at least even a couple of years ago, if I had a list of folks we were doing a project with and they were all middle-aged white dudes, that would oh not gosh. have seemed amiss to me. Like oh, they, they look fine. You know, some of them are bald, some of them have hair. So we've got mm -hmm. a good mix and it's been only in the past couple of years that we've really started thinking about who are these voices that we're not hearing. It yeah. seems like that's a, a consideration that's at the top of your mind, even in the, since the inception of your. Yeah. So when I started the woman in supply chain series, I just wanted to hear from other women in the industry. You know, what was your path to success? What does your path look like now? Where do you want to go? You know, what have you learned along the way? What were the challenges just to really learn from them? It wasn't really like a female empowerment thing. It was just, let's give them a platform so that we can learn from them, whether we are male, female, you know, what have you. And so I think, I think it's really worked in that respect. I do want to expand on the diversity and inclusion conversation. And so I'm working on some stuff that's going to come out in Q4 um, to do with that. And we're going to be talking to all sorts of diverse voices in the community about their challenges and, and different things like that. So I'm excited about that. I can't tell you too much because I can't <laughs> reveal what we're doing, but sure. uh, it's, it's going to be fun. All right. So we'll watch that space for sure. When someone is approaching you to ask for a, a contribution to a project, some content or an interview or something like that, is there something that makes you more likely to say yes? So I think that that's a great question. And it really depends on the, I guess, the opportunity and who I'm talking to. Um, for the most part, when it comes to interacting with people, um, I try to get back to everybody because I feel like if they're, you know, taking the time to come to us, I want to make sure that we're honoring, honoring that time. As far as the opportunities, it really varies. Um, I mean, it, it depends on whether I'm going to get compensated for my time, um, potentially what that, that uh, audience looks like. Because listen, I mean, there's only so much you can do for free, right? I mean, I'm the breadwinner of the family and I've got to be able to support my family. And uh, so there's only so much time in the day and there's only so many things that you can do. And so I want to reach diverse audiences globally. And so that's always a factor for me. It's not always payment, but it is, you know, something that I do have to consider depending on what's happening at the time. And um, really whether my values are aligned, right? I want to be able to work with other people that are collaborative, right? Collaboration is a big part of who I am. My company name is Victorious, which means winning together. And so that's a really big value um, that I want to consider. And it's got to be a win-win on both sides. So as far as a deal breaker for someone reaching out where you immediately go, uh, absolutely not. Well, it would be the opposite of that, I would guess. Yeah, I don't 
don't know if there is any. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty open to all of the opportunities. I want to have a conversation with somebody at least because that's how you can really get to know them and understand what they're, what they're looking for. A deal breaker would be if I have another event that day, I guess. Sure. <laughs> so I want to also talk about though, is you are now, you're kind of straddling the supply chain and the marketing world with what you're doing with the podcast and having to promote that, but also you are starting this new company and getting ships off the ground and you're having to build out that marketing plan as well. So what is that process like? And do, does that tie together with the podcast promotion? Huh? Yeah, no, no, it absolutely does. Um, and actually one of the reasons why I kept building uh, Let's Talk Supply Chain was because of ships, because, you know, a lot of times when you're a founder of a company, you're um, very much involved, obviously, on the development because this is a tech company, right? So now I'm marrying supply chain, tech, and marketing. Um, and when you're a founder, you're very much about product, right? Um, and then sort of marketing second, potentially. I mean, that's not everybody, but um, sometimes a lot of the time, obviously, because you need a product to be able to get on onto market so that you can get investment dollars. So as I've been building ships, I've also been building Let's Talk Supply Chain, and it gives me a medium. It gives me um, a way to be able to get that brand out. I mean, I've been talking about ships on the podcast probably for 18 months to two years now, and so people are used to hearing the name. I haven't done a huge push, um, but I've talked about it at the end of every podcast. When I go up on stage and I'm moderating a panel or I'm a panelist, it's always that I'm founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain and CEO of Ships. So just really getting that brand awareness early. And then it gives me the content platform uh, because I have a blog. I not, not only have the podcast, I have a YouTube channel called the SC Supply Chain TV. We have a blog. We have the podcast. You know, I'm asked frequently to moderate panels and be a panelist. And so I've already been able to establish, you know, the thought leader um, thought leadership stuff that that a lot of founders tend to do second that is a classic that would make joe polizzi of the content marketing institute smile in his heart to hear that you you've built a business by giving in the content bringing the value attracting an audience and now you're able to direct that audience's attention at your new project that is that is really cool yeah and i'm excited i mean we're <laughs> we're launching soon and uh I'm working on a pretty, pretty fun video right now, which is going to be uh, good. Fantastic. So where should people look for your content? Where are places that they should go? Uh, how many things would you like to plug right now? Because this is your time. <laughs> I'm going to plug a lot. Okay. So the website is letstalksupplychain.com. The ship's website is S-H-I-P-Z or Z dot com as well. Um, over on LinkedIn, we have a pretty active Let's Talk Supply Chain LinkedIn page, or you can connect with me directly, Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I'd love to connect with you. So please reach out and connect with me. We're also on Instagram. So at Let's Talk Supply Chain, we're on Twitter, Let's Talk S Chain. For ships, it's I Love Ships. Um, and for me, it's Be Victorious. So that's should be about it. But on the, on the websites, you can find all of our content. Um, you can find YouTube, podcasts, and blog. Fantastic. And the, I'm sure you can subscribe to the podcast anywhere that people are getting their podcasts yes, from. Fantastic. That is a very good point. So you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, you name it, Player FM. We are there. And it's let, so L-E-T-S, no apostrophe. All right. Yeah, every podcast that we develop for a client, I at the end would have our host say the whole litany of every podcast platform. And now we just say, and you can find it wherever you are already listening yes. to podcasts. That too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It yeah, seems yeah. to work fine. So yeah. our last question is a little bit open-ended. I call it a Rorschach test kind of question, whatever it means to you. There are no wrong answers. The, this is called the Break Free Podcast. So we want to ask what should B2B leaders in your field be doing to break free, whatever that means to you? So I think that they need to be leaning into their teams and allowing them to really shine from a social media perspective. And I'm going to say that from a LinkedIn perspective, because I think we need more voices. We need more voices on a platform like LinkedIn, interacting, sharing thoughts, um, and really supporting them and being able to share those thoughts. Um, I think it's important. And so that's, 
that's what I would say. And I also think that they are handling a lot of things right now. There's a lot of things coming at them. They're handling a lot of emotions when it comes to their teams. And I just also want to make sure that, you know, supply chain leaders, marketing leaders are taking time for themselves and making sure that they are, you know, not only checking in on their teams, but checking on each other and their team or and themselves as well. Perfect. So take care of your teams, be prepared for consistent change and check out Sarah Barnes Humphrey on every channel that you can, because you're absolutely fascinating. And thank you for your time today. Ah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And we'll see you all next time. 